Yep, perfect. Awesome. Okay. Guten Tag. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, so it's been really interesting to be asked to talk about the international trends because a lot of the talks I give are about how to practically build an online community. And I think it's really interesting to kind of look up and see what's going on in the broader environment and then think about how we are going to use that to improve how we develop our online communities. If you don't know who I am, I'm a community consultant, the founder of Feverbee, been doing this for around a decade now um, with clients like Apple, Facebook, Google, SAP, Audi, many others, and published um, a couple of books as well. And what I think we've got a very strong track record of doing, working uh, internally with employees and working externally with customers, is taking almost any online community and being able to embed some very specific things that increase the level of growth, that increase the level of, of, of participation, which gets members more active and more engaged in that community. And a very key part of that is knowing what's happening in the environment, knowing what are the trends, knowing what the future looks like, and then incorporating that <clears throat> into our strategies today. If we think about a lot of the goals of a community strategy at the moment, maybe we don't say it, but if we're honest, a lot of the goals that we see and most of the strategies we've seen are to increase the level of engagement. And I think when we think about this with a new client or new project that we go into, the very first thing we look at is how engaged are members in that community? What are they finding enjoyable? What are they not finding enjoyable? But one of the really interesting things to be doing the last couple of years is to be collecting all this data from out there in the ecosystem, from all these other kinds of public online communities, not private, I admit I don't have much visibility in employee communities at the moment, but to try and get a sense of what are the broader engagement trends out there today? And what we find is actually really interesting. If we look at the number of people participating in communities, what we've seen recently is that obviously there's a big uh, spike as a result of the pandemic. You can see around March uh, 2020, the level of participation in terms of users and posts suddenly rose dramatically. But since then, it's settled down a little bit until the last couple of months. And now we're beginning to see that the number of users is still declining, but the number of posts are rising. So what I'm going to do, I'm, as outlined maybe 15 different trends for you today, but one of the really interesting ones for me is that at least in the traditional online community approach where there's a hosted platform, and I'm not talking so much about social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, those kind of things, but one of the things I'm noticing is that in hosted platforms, there seems to be more participation from fewer pe pe people. And that means people are still visiting that community. They're still reading, they're still getting more information, but they're less likely to participate. So I think we have to consider that, whether the level of engagement is as high or, or is going in the, in the direction we want, is what are the bigger trends that are going on here? Because knowing that bigger trends really helps us to determine whether we're doing a good job or whether we're doing a bad job. And I think that's the first thing. Next, we begin to look at what is often within the normal scope of a strategy of that community. This is where we begin looking at the technology and the onboarding and how we manage that community. What are the discussions we initiate? What are the content we create? What are the events and activities we introduce? What does the MVP Pro program look like? What are the rewards we offer members for participating? And each one of these things directly impact the level of engagement. And what we find is that there are certain trends in here as well. One of them is that mature platforms are generally, there's fewer mature platforms at the moment. We see that at the enterprise level, it's pretty stable at the moment. Internally, Yammer has most of the market at the moment. Externally, there's a few major players, maybe five or six with Chorus and Insided and Vanilla and Higher Logic and, pl and platforms like that, Berint as well. And it's relatively stable, but there's more and more niche trends that are arising. Niche communities, niche, niche platforms, that in a way are salami slicing different groups, different parts of a community. Things like documentation, things like chatbots, things like all these other technologies that are coming along that are gradually starting to salami slice away some of the things that community used to do. Trend number three is onboarding. When we look to see what organizations are doing at the moment, we're starting to see some really interesting techniques for onboarding people into a community. With a lot of the community professionals that we work with and that um, our clients or trainees of us, we help them develop a whole onboarding journey. 
And if you go to smaplig.com, S-M-A-P-L-Y.com, you can create your whole onboarding journey, which outlines specifically what people are going to do at different times. And this is really useful, and we're seeing a use of tools like this more and more often. And what we're also seeing is that there are these custom tools that you can integrate to a lot of platforms today that will allow you to build custom onboarding journeys. If you look at Ver uh, Vericode here, one of our clients, we can see that when you join, instead of just being dropped into this dead end, which happens far too often, especially in employee online communities, we're seeing these launch pads beginning to be launched. This is on Salesforce, but there's many other variations of this, where first you're taken to fill out your profile, complete your role, and then you're taken to follow some topics, follow some top members. And so you're not beginning that community with a blank slate. You're guided into participating in a really particular area in a really particular way. I think over the last couple of years, we're getting, and we've gotten a lot better at onboarding people to a community, welcoming a newcomer and turning them into a top member of that community. We're also noticing that there's a bigger priority given to retention. We've collected so much data on this to figure out what is the retention rate in how newcomers participate in that community. And what we've discovered, we're looking at millions of data points out there at the moment, that the retention rate for a newcomer is far higher if in their very first post in that community, they start a discussion as opposed to responding to an existing one. And there's all these like five or 6% wins that you can introduce to your community at the moment. And when you add them all up, what you find is that you can increase participation by 20%, 30%, 50% without having to do anything particularly crazy, without having to do a big platform change or any of the big initiatives that a lot of people seem prone to do. Another thing that really matters if we're thinking about onboarding, and we know that onboarding is becoming more and more important, is that getting a response to the first contribution matters a lot. If someone has recently joined a community, whether it's an employee community or customer community, if they don't get a response to their very first post, the chances of them ever participating again is around 13%. But if they do get a response, that is 59%. That's a huge win. And I've lost track of the number of communities that really don't understand that they spend all this time and money and energy getting people to visit and make their first post, and then they don't even make the effort to respond. So there's a huge win right there that we can implement. Next, I think we're seeing the professionalization of the community field. A lot of people have drifted into this job from other fields, and it means a lot of us used to learn on the job. And I think what's interesting right now, we have training courses from ourselves and different organizations, We've partnered with uh, Tanya Laub, who you all know, to do one in, Germ in Germany as well, um, to train people to run communities extremely well. And we're seeing the benefits of that already. We're seeing there's a body of skills and knowledge that when people have acquired this, they can build much better communities at, as a result. And we're seeing the benchmarks with our accelerator tool. When we look at all the aspects of managing a community and look at how people are doing, we're finding more and more often that they are getting better and better and better. Their benchmarks are a lot higher than what they used to be. And I think our profession is becoming far more professional with clear uh, bodies of knowledge, clear techniques and clear tactics that we expected to learn. And I think one consequence of that is that we are getting a lot better at increasing the response rates to questions and reducing the time to first response. What we do every couple of months with external online communities is scrape all this data and analyze it to try and determine what is the best online community out there today. And what we find is usually a graph like this, which is when we look at the response rate, when we look at the average time to first response and the percentage of questions for which are solved to answers and how large the communities are. OK, it's a bit messy in the bottom left because we're trying to squeeze too many communities into it. But what we're noticing is that, generally speaking, we are getting better at responding to questions. We're getting quicker at responding to questions. We're getting better at tagging whether those questions are resolved or not. And I think this is a major trend that is a result of the professionalization of this field. The more professional we get, the more of these organizations have professionally trained community managers at the helm, especially if they're doing it as a full time job, the better the results are going to be. And the time to first response is so critical as well. When we look at the data, 
what we find is that if you um, if someone is, is new to your community and makes their first post, if you respond within two hours, there's a 58% chance they will they participate again. After 18 hours, that drops to 55%. But then after that, it begins to plummet really, really fast. After three days, that drops to 48%. After a week, it's 41%. After two weeks, it's around 36% and so on. What this means with when we know things like this is that if we can make sure if someone's making their first post, if we respond really quickly within that 18 hour time frame, we're going to have far more active communities. We're going to retain so many of the members that we used to lose. And there's a huge win in just doing this right and building whole systems that can do this better. And I think we've seen with clients a trend towards doing this a lot better and giving this the priority that it deserves. Trend number six, I think, is a shift away from trying to engage lurkers or what I prefer learners in that community towards engaging the very top members and realizing that ultimately the success of almost every community depends not upon trying to engage the masses, but to make sure we have a small group, a relatively small group of top members that are highly engaged, the kind of members that can respond to every question, the kind of members who, depending upon what cat category they're in, create far more value than what they consume within that community. And what we find is that the top 1% of um, members in many communities can be creating 61% of the posts or a low of 11% of the posts. And it varies so much by different kinds of communities, but we can see that having a small number of top members is critical to success. And I think we're seeing a lot of us getting better and better at doing that. We're understanding rewards better than what we used to. We're also understanding that maximizing the level of engagement isn't the goal because success requires fewer members than what a lot, a lot of us think. If your community is based around support, say Q&A, I ask a question and you've given me an, the answer, we find that a tiny number of top members can answer hundreds or even thousands of questions every month. A tiny number of top members can be sharing and curating the advice from thousands or dozens of different articles across the web. We're finding that a tiny number of members can share great ideas and give you feedback and guide you to where you want it to go. So, so success in most communities doesn't require maximizing the level of engagement. It requires figuring out who is really important to that community and then spending far more time and effort on them and realizing how many of these people we need. And usually this varies by the number of participants or the number of questions we're getting a month. And you see here, it's not that many. Compared to what we usually think, it's not that many. And then also knowing how we motivate them, not by giving them a huge amount of swag or money or tangible rewards, but very often giving them more access, very often giving them more influence, giving them more status, giving them more connection, making them realize that they are really useful and helpful within that community. And I think that's a trend that's just going to grow and grow. Trend number seven. I think we're seeing a declining use of gamification. I think gamification was all the rage maybe five or 10 years ago, or five to seven years ago, I think. But in terms of its ability to influence behavior, it's less and less important than what it used to be. And instead, things like we were just talking about, things like access, things like status, but the more implicit sense of status, not you are a badge for asking 10 questions, but the more implicit, those more subtle signs of status are more important. So we're seeing a decline in use and value in gamification as a tool. And what we can see when we map out these and how they influence engagement is that there's a traffic light system we, we can deploy here. If we think about how each of these things influence a level of engagement, what we often do with clients is benchmark these in how well they're being utilized at the moment. And if we look at the current trends, I think we're seeing technology, Kind of neither here or there. Um, it could be heading in the right direction. It could not. It's getting easier to use, but there's less choice in many aspects. But in terms of onboarding, MVP program, community management, I think that's a green light. I think we're getting a lot better at that. And in terms of rewards, this is probably not what we're not so good on at the moment. And I expect some changes here. And I think very often when we develop strategies for community, we optimize just for these things. Well, but we forget there's a whole environment of things going on around here. There's a whole environment that we need to understand. Because at the moment we have engagement, we have the community experience we were just talking about at the moment. But ultimately, and this is what many strategies 
we've seen ne neglect and why I think our work is often quite successful is that it's important to realize the environment determines your fate. Every community lives within an environment and it can feel like at times if you don't consider the environment that you're on a melting block of ice being swept away by the currents. And that's why we have to realize that there is an environment that we operate within. And I think this environment consists of five different forces at the moment. One is the level of internal support you get versus the level of pressure. Two is the degree to which you need to push your community towards your members and the degree to which you pull your members towards you. Three is how challenging or difficult your members are to, to uh, engage and, and, to keep, and to keep engaged. Some audiences are far more difficult than others. Four is how competitive um, it is. How are there other places people can get that same information? And five is your tolerance to risk versus your need to explore. And I think trend number eight would be a rising understanding of communities, but also that comes with rising pressure. If we look at the state of community management report by the community roundtable, what we generally see is people are more familiar with communities than they've ever been. There's more understanding. When we're doing budgets for our clients and we're, ad we're allocating resources, what we find is that it's getting easier to get the budgets that we need to do the strategies that we want to do. And we're also seeing a trend for these integrated community hubs as well, where everything is integrated into one place rather than the, than the community being hived off into its own separate place. And I think that's where things are heading at the moment on a lot of these things towards an integrated community hub rather than an isolated place. And I think it's also ties into trend nine, which is closer alignment to the strategic goals. Very often a community was a thing that sounded cool and fun to do, and I think more and more it's being very closely aligned to the strategic goals of the organization. And that's a very good thing, but it also means there's going to be more pressure to deliver results. Trend number 10, declining reach. I think this is probably the most overlooked trend in the community space at the moment. And I think this is going to be a bigger issue really, really soon. And I think this trend comes in a couple of forms. For external communities, Google is keeping more and more traffic from itself. So if you are, say, SAP and you're used to getting um, a lot of traffic from a online community or your external community, what we're seeing is that if that information is being uh, featured as a snippet in the search result, people are less likely to visit the community. Google is keeping more traffic for itself, and that's going to be to the detriment of a lot of brand communities out there today. But another major trend is that it's getting harder and harder to engage people by, by, people by email. It used to be relatively easy to send out a newsletter or a digest or a notification and engage a lot of people all at once to really bring people back into the community or to promote your community. It's getting harder to do that today. Emails are less effective than what they used to be. And that means for private communities or um, that personalized outreach is going to matter a lot. Automated messages are going to be less successful, partly because they're being put in promotional fold, uh, fold, folders as well, and that's having a big impact. But I think overall, emails are less effective. And I think networking is going to play a critical role and going through the viral networks of your audiences, getting them to invite uh, their connections in a personal way, that's going to be a trend that rises. Trend number 12, the demand for convenience or less effort. I think if there's one ever present trend in how we engage online is that we want to spend less and less effort doing things. I think we always want things to be more convenient. And I think we see that very often when we've created a um, Yammer based community or a SharePoint community or a hosted forum and we find that people don't use it and they continue using email or whatever tool is like most relevant to them. But the problem with this is that it's so frustrating that they're not using this platform that we spent so much time and effort and, and money on. But to them, it's less effort. It's in the flow of what they're doing at the moment. It's going to be harder and harder to get people to visit a hosted online platform. And I think if we're going to do that, then the positioning of that community, which I'll talk about in a second, is going to be of paramount importance. If we can't properly position the community to be unique, to deliver value that members need, and then put it in a pathway, in the flow of what members are doing at the moment, people are going to be less likely to visit that, that community. 
And we ignore this at our peril, we really do. Another thing we're seeing is that mobile growth has probably peaked for, this is from a client, from around 2009 to around what, 20, let's say 2016, 2017, we saw mo mo mobile traffic going up and up and up. And I think that curve is probably about the peak of where it is today. For some communities, that's around 80%, like you see in this one. For other kinds of communities, especially internal communities, is often a lot lower, probably around uh, 40 or 50% max, which means whatever level of mobile participation you have today, it's probably not going to advance too far uh, beyond that. But critically, if you want to engage your members over the long term, you've got to be better at being in the flow of what your audience are doing today, because the idea they're going to remember and to create a habit of visiting your community, that's probably not going to happen as often as what it used to. Trend 13, and we're almost at the end here, is rising competition. I think the competition for the mind share of your audience is becoming ferocious. Sure, your members could engage in your community, or maybe they could ask a friend or a colleague, or maybe they could search some documentation for what they want, or maybe they just might not bother and just watch you watch you watch YouTube clips instead. So what we're seeing, you know, with HP and, and, and another of our clients is that there's so many different ways that people can get information. There's chatbots, there are diagnostic tools, there are other rival online communities. And it means that the positioning of that community is going to be more and more important. The positioning in the mind of your audience is going to be more and more important. And very often we see communities, at least externally, that are like this, where maybe you aim your community to be trustworthy and quite personalized, but there's other places where people can get that information. In this example, it makes far more sense for a customer to ask for customer support instead, because it does both things even better. So the challenge is figuring out what is the thing that only your community can deliver. Maybe it's speed of response. Maybe it's quality of response. Maybe it's trustworthiness. Maybe it's personalization. But what do those two axes look like for the communities that you're working on? And how does that compare to all of the substitutes, all of the other places competing for the mind share of your audience. And trend num uh, number 14 is declining tolerance for risk. It used to be very common to launch a community and just see what happens. You know, just use it to explore what's happening. And what we're seeing due to raising or rising um, data privacy concerns, security concerns, and also reputational concerns as well. What if someone says something bad? There's a declining risk to tolerance within a community. And I think that's going to have a big impact that we're going to be expected to get things right first time instead of being able to test something at a small scale first and then adapt and expand as we go on. So to put all these things together in one graph and we, and we kind of code the, the, this as well to see what's working, what's not working. We see that engagement is kind of static at the moment. Maybe the number of users um, is slightly going down, but the level of uh, participation per member is going up. Technology is kind of sta static as well, um, kind of in the middle. It's nothing too much going on. Onboarding and managing communities, the MVP programs are quite good. The wards aren't doing so well. There's more awareness, which is good, but a little bit more pressure as well. Declining reach is going to be a problem for us, and that's going to continue in the future. The audience are going to be more demanding and convenience driven than ever. This is why it's really good to measure the effort score of your community. There's going to be rising levels of competition and then finally a declining tolerance for risk. And when you're planning out your strategies and your engagement efforts, I think it's really worth thinking about how all these things fit together and all of them influence what you do. That broader environment affects how you manage and engage that community, that community experience, which in turn will affect the level of engagement. So when you're designing your strategies and your tactics and your approaches, figure out what's going on in the environment and swim with the current. Don't try to fight the forces that are that are working against you. Go with the tide. Figure out what's happening and how you adapt your plan to to prevail and thrive in that kind of environment. Um, if you found this really useful, please uh, buy a copy of my book on um, on Amazon.com. It's my new book, Build Your Community, and we spend a lot of time going into the skills that you can use to turn any of your connections, your uh, employees, your customers, um, any online audience you're engaging with. How do you turn them into a really thriving online community? And if you buy it this week and 
email me the proof or the receipt, I'll give you access to our accelerator tool as well. Um, thank you so, so much for listening. I know I little, went a little bit over time there, um, but if you have any questions, um, please feel free to jump in now. Thank you so much, everyone.